Good morning. Uh, I just want to um, begin by saying what a pleasure it is to be here today. And um, I just have to say that I think Emily is amazing. Um, I threw her more curveballs than uh, a person <laughs> should get. And she's been just incredibly wonderful and resourceful and helpful and non-reactive, <laughs> which I really appreciate. That's OK. You know? So I'm, I'm really grateful for that. And um, Seth, clearly, you've been very involved as well. And I just appreciate both of your um, work. Um, I want to say that for those of you who are going to follow my slides very carefully in your handbooks, that they've changed, which was one of the curveballs that I threw Emily. But um, it, it does happen that you think about things between the day you send in your slides and the day you present. And I, I did that. So I apologize. Uh, the, the findings from Mining the Baby are unchanged, but the lead-in um, is not. And um, <clears throat> finally, I, I want to say that um, I, like everybody else in New England, uh, is f I'm fighting off a, a virus that I've had for a couple weeks. So if I start to cough, don't worry. I'm I'm going to make it through my talk, so um, I presume. All right, so um, without further ado, um, I just want to start by mentioning that uh, Minding the Baby is a, as I'm going to tell you about, is a mother-infant intervention um, that's been around for 13 years. And <clears throat> there's a, uh, a group of people that have been instrumental in this presentation and um, are instrumental in the work. Uh, my three co-directors, Lois Sadler, Nancy Close, and Linda Mays, and um, Benny Finch and Rosie Price, who is the clinical team down here in the second row trying to be invisible, um, <laughs> work that the uh, mother I'm going to talk a little bit about, uh, Tanika Simpson and Denise Webb, um, who are the other, is the other clinical team, and two graduate students who did a lot of work that was helpful to me in formulating this, Madeline Terry and Jessica Gorkin. Um, now, what the over, my overview of what I'm going to be presenting today is there are many routes um, to BPD. And um, I, there's, I'm sure, um, still plenty of controversy of what the primary routes are, the secondary routes are. But um, I'm going to talk about one line of work which um, talks about one of the routes of um, BPD being the intergenerational transmission of trauma. And um, I'm going to talk about it within the context of Minding the Baby, which is an early intervention program. We've had um, very uh, positive results that suggest that intervening early with very traumatized mothers um, can have very nice outcomes for their babies, so that their babies start off their lives with more protective factors, with um, things built in for them and in, and in the mother-child relationship that are going to make it much more likely that they have a different trajectory from the ones um, that their mothers had. Um, you know, I obviously, uh, this is all um, hopeful, but I do want to tell you about Mining the Baby. And then I'm going to tell you about a case study, Natasha and Joey. <clears throat> so let me start off by talking about the work that I'm sure um, many of you are familiar with which was the work of Bessel van der Kolk and Judith Herman uh, about 20, 25 years ago, when they started talking about the fact that many of the patients that they were treating um, who were diagnosed with borderline personality disorders um, actually had um, severe, significant childhood sexual abuse, physical abuse, neglect, and overwhelming traumatic relational events. Now, um, one of the things that we talk a lot about today um, in infant research, and I, I, I'm, I don't think it's probably penetrated to this world as much, is we talk about infants being exposed to toxic stress, which means overwhelming, stressful events, including poverty, racism, food insufficiency, et cetera, but also familial trauma. And I've started to think about toxic stress the most pernicious part is being toxic relational stress, you know, early disruptions in the relationship, whether you call it attachment trauma, relational stress, but it's really one of the potential pathways to the development of severe psychopathology and um, potentially um, BPD and other um, <clears throat> severe personality disorders. Um, and in fact, what uh, Judith Herman and Bessel van der Kolk did in the early 90s is they said, 
maybe a better way to talk about some of what we're seeing in, this, in adults is to talk about these as post-traumatic adaptations, as something they call developmental trauma disorder or complex trauma disorder. That is, this comprises one, uh, one group of the larger uh, group of individuals um, with BPD. And uh, the, the work that they did on developmental and complex trauma disorder has been um, extremely important because what they've done, what, what really happened was up until the, this era, people tended to think of trauma in terms of, of single event traumas that would cause PTSD or traumas that were, you know, a series of events that would cause uh, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. But what they gradually began to think about was that in fact the kinds of traumas that were leading to uh, complex trauma disorders were in fact um, traumas that took place over developmental periods, that is not just at one or two points in time, but over developmental periods, and in relation to primary caregivers. That is, these are disruptions that take place, uh, and I, I think from a developmental standpoint, the idea that it takes place chronically um, over time <clears throat> and in one's primary relationships is what really um, distinguishes them, let's say, from PTSD. And a lot of individuals with complex trauma disorders look as if they have depression, anxiety, self-hatred, dissociation, substance abuse, self-destructive and risk-taking behaviors, re-victimization, problems with interpersonal and intimate relations, including parenting, which I, you know, underline, emphasize, um, bold, et cetera, and also to have medical and somatic com concerns and despair. And you'll notice that that list, which, which is uh, unlike the list I'm also about to show you on the next slide, are not dissimilar from what Emily um, put up on her slide about the, di the DSM criteria for <clears throat> borderline personality disorder. So that when you've had the misfortune of being in a family situation where you're chronically exposed to trauma over the course of development within your primary relationships, complex trauma disorder is one possible outcome. And they talk about a series of essential post-traumatic adaptations that, ah, oh, I was gonna say, where's my Kleenex? <clears throat> I, have a, I have a whole um, drugstore up here. Um, sorry. Um, they talk about a series of post-traumatic adaptations, and I want you to think about what it would be like to be a child if your mother is experiencing these post-traumatic adaptations. And again, these are very similar to the list that Emily put up. But alterations in the regulation of affective impulses, that is, affect dysregulation um, become, being um, both impulsive and dysregulated, alterations in attention and consciousness, that is, individuals who've experienced trauma over the course of development often are prone to dissociation and, you know, sort of out-of-body experiences and other forms of forgetting and numbing, et cetera. <clears throat> alterations in self-perception, the inability to really um, see yourself in any kind of a coherent light, but actually to take on the perceptions of the perpetrator who might have se seen you as terrible and bad and evil and worthy of abuse, and that's one of the ways that individuals with complex trauma take on the perpetrator's vision of them. Alterations in relationships to others, which clearly um, w we see all the time in our mothers, and um, <clears throat> many of you who've worked with individuals like this see as well. Uh, somatic and medical complaints, and I, I'm gonna come back to this um, many times over, which is that minding the baby is an interdisciplinary, inter interdisciplinary intervention that brings together health and mental health work in the home from the time the mother is pregnant. And one of the things that you see in the individuals who've been exposed to significant trauma is their relationships to their bodies are very disrupted. And this can manifest itself <clears throat> very simply in the inability to um, take care of themselves physically, not only things like nutrition and smoking, et cetera, but more basically to take the medications that are prescribed for them, to take the medications that are prescribed for their children, to monitor physical symptoms in their children that, oh, by the way, I didn't say, if you want copies of these slides, um, <clears throat> my email will be on my last slide, and you can feel free to 
write and ask me for them. And uh, thank you. Uh, I see you taking notes. So, uh, so we, we very much feel that addressing the somatic side as well as the relational side, as well as the developmental side and the attachment side are very important. And alterations in systems of meaning, which has to do with what um, actually um, Terry, I'm sorry, um, Emily had on her slide um, having to do with despair. You know, that is losing sight of the larger meaning of life and the larger meaning of oneself in life. <clears throat> now, so there's, I'm going to just stop for a minute. So there's the complex trauma literature, which really focuses on the long-term effects of trauma. And then there's been a whole other line of research that is, I think, just so fascinating and so clinically important to everything that we do. And it is finally getting recognized. But it's a study that was started over 20 years ago, and it was called the Adverse Childhood Experiences um, Study. How many of you are familiar with it? That's really interesting. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, I think, um, I'm hoping that in five years, every hand in this audience would go up. But what they did was um, these two researchers, um, Felitti and Anda and many colleagues, uh, interviewed, cre created a way, they didn't do it themselves, they interviewed 17,000 middle-income adults who were seen within the Kaiser Permanente system in California. And they did retrospective accounts, and they developed a questionnaire asking them about early adverse childhood experiences. And they looked at how these early experiences uh, predicted to medical problems and to psychological problems and, and behavioral problems later in life. And they, cre they collected 20 years of data, and as I said, it's 17, a, a sample of 17,000, and they found a strong graded relationship between the number of adverse childhood experiences <clears throat> the level of traumatic stress in childhood and health, mental health and behavioral outcomes later in life. Now here are the um, key things that are assessed by the ACE questionnaire. Whether um, an individual has had recurrent physical or emotional abuse before 18, contact sexual abuse, had an alcohol or drug abuser in the household, had an incarcerated family member, had a chronically depressed or mentally ill family member, um, mother treated violently, one or no parents, or physical or emotional neglect. And it's a fairly simple questionnaire that is just administered when um, individuals come in for their um, checkup. Now, um, they've started, uh, some various um, medical centers have now started integrating this into their work so that they pick up children who are experiencing early adverse childhood experiences when they're very young within the context of their medical visits, but that's very forward thinking. So the ACE study found that health, comes, health outcomes, including cancer, chronic lung disease, liver disease, ischemic heart disease, musculoskeletal fractures, autoimmune disorders, were strong. The, the, if you had a four or above on the ACEs questionnaire, you are more likely to have developed these illnesses and often to, um, and to have pre, uh, early death, as well as substance abuse, um, sexually transmitted diseases, smoking, and obesity. And the mental health and behavioral outcomes included depression, suicidality, PTSD, and the intergenerational transmission of abuse and teen pregnancy. So that what happened to you in childhood predicts to these health. The mental health outcomes, of course, don't surprise us at all or they didn't surprise me, but the health outcomes, you know, really knocked me out. Now there's a recent study that came out in 2013 where um, they uh, collected data from subjects in the National Comorbidity Survey replication, which was, again, 5,500 individuals. And the higher your level of childhood adversity, the greater your number of separate DSM diagnoses the number of different DSM disorder categories, which is consistent with that slide I showed you before, where anxiety, depression, et cetera, uh, all are comorbid, which uh, the complex trauma people feel is a reflection of the fact that actually the anxiety, depression are symptoms of an underlying disorder, and that's that underlying disorder not, that needs to be treated, not necessarily CBT for depression or anxiety, but really to address the trauma disorder. Um, 
And finally, uh, childhood adversity was associated with the presence of coexisting internalizing and externalizing disorders. So there's a lot of reason to worry about children experiencing adverse early experiences. Um, now this is a slide I borrowed from um, a wonderful uh, slide presentation by the group listed above. But we call, you know, there are all these different ways of talking about adverse childhood experience. Uh, you know, whether you call it developmental trauma disorder or toxic stress or adverse childhood experiences, it's just important to recognize that we really have to intervene as early as possible to um, keep these from having the, the long-term effects that they can. So a major public health goal, obviously, is what I've been saying, is to decrease adverse childhood experiences or toxic relational stress because these contribute in a direct way to later psychopathology. So I want to talk now for um, a little while about the mechanisms for the intergenerational transmission of trauma. Er, sorry. should have opened this first. I'm going to talk about a, a couple of fairly simple relationships. One is that um, maternal trauma history leads to disruptions in a parent's capacity to mentalize. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what that means. I know Carla Sharp will be talking about mentalizing later this afternoon. But mentalizing refers very simply to the capacity well, the, the, simple, the definition is the capacity to envision mental states in the self or the other. But at a very simple level, it means when my baby is crying, can I begin to try to imagine why she might be crying? Can I be curious about it? Can I wonder about it? Can I engage in problem solving to figure out which of my hypotheses are correct? Or do I simply try to control the crying because I want it to stop? Or can I engage in the wondering process? And parents who have difficulty engaging in that wondering process, which I'll describe in more detail, have disrupted interactions with their children and are disabled in their caregiving, by which I mean that it's very hard for them to protect the child, to um, keep the child in mind. But I've, I've been thinking of it a lot lately as, as really one of the primary functions of a parent is to protect, protect their offspring from danger is to protect their offspring from harm. And if your child ceases being someone that you can really see and really appreciate as a child and really appreciate as having the motivations and the developmental capacities of an infant, you're going to be much less likely to be able to feel like a caregiver and act like a caregiver. And of course, then you get into the whole question of how of their own models and their own uh, feelings about their own parents and how uh, unable they may feel to take on a mothering or fathering role. And disrupted parent parental mentalization, we believe, also contributes to the um, disorganized attachment in infancy. And disorganized attachment in infancy is um, a very um, uh, problematic, uh, has, it's very highly represented in clinical samples. Um, there's tremendous, I think, public health value, which no one has really costed out yet. But the lower the, the, the lower the levels of disorganized attachment, the less likely you are to see behavioral outcomes, you know, really pretty quickly. And then to sh they, they will show up. Um, disorganized attachment does have a, a, a rate of predicting um, various forms of severe personality disorders and so on. So we really want to uh, minimize uh, disorganized attachment in infancy. So uh, this I think I don't need to spend a lot of time on. I, I think this is something that um, I've just reviewed, which is maternal. When you have a mother with a trauma history, uh, it's likely that she's making a variety of these post-traumatic adaptations. She's looking very complex diagnostically. She's having trouble regulating her impact, her affects, particularly negative affects, and to contain her impulses. Profound alterations in the sense of self, other, and the body. And then, and this is something I really um, want to emphasize because it's it's really the balance that we're after clinically, which is that um, individuals who've experienced a lot of trauma 
are very vulnerable to arousal. That is, when they get aroused, which can happen very readily and very quickly, they're vulnerable to defenses such as fight, flight, or freezing, freezing being um, the most uh, pathognomonic uh, way of responding. And that this vulnerability to arousal often goes against the part of them that might be able to think about what's going on in the other person's mind, think about what's going on in their own mind, that the, we want to work on keeping the arousal level low so that they can continue to think about the baby, to feel the baby, et cetera. Um, now, uh, let me talk briefly about what parental mentalization looks like. I mean, it's a very important capacity in parents. It's a curiosity, as I said, an openness to the child's thoughts and feelings. But let me give you a very quick example. You know, mother um, takes her 15-month-old, uh, and they're going to stop um, and pick up some food on the way home. And he, she's just picked her child up from um, daycare. He's 15 months old. He's hungry. He's tired. They pull into the supermarket, and he starts up. I don't want to go. Take me home. And, you know, she has to get the shopping done. You know, it's the end of the day. She doesn't really have any choice. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, mother number one says, you know, the, the magic mother that we wish we all were and had, um, but says, oh, it's okay, honey. You know, we're just going to have to stop for a few minutes here. You know, let me give you a hug, and I'm going to put you in the card, and here's a bagel for you to chew on, those of you who aren't from New York. I presume you know what a bagel is. Um, but it's a very good thing to have when you're tired and cranky. Um, <laughs> So the mother hands the child something to drink, something to eat, and he can remain regulated through this trip through the grocery store. He may want to grab something off the shelf, but what happens in this instance is the mother recognizes what his states are, what his needs are. He needs to be talked to. He needs to be touched. He needs to be calmed down. He needs to get through that 10 minutes of excruciating shopping time, and that she has a big part to play in that uh, adaptation. And what's going to happen at the end of that 10 minutes is that mom's not going to be all freaked out either. She's not going to be all dysregulated because you're not going to have the cycle that you might see in another situation where by the time, let's take the other situation, which is they get to the parking lot, the child starts to whine, and the mom says, okay, we're not going through this again. You do it every single time, and I want you to be quiet. And she picks him up out of the car, you know, and she's tense, and she probably, you know, hurts him a tiny bit, you know, puts him in the cart and says, now you just cut it out and you can, you know, she doesn't give him anything to eat, she doesn't soften her voice, she doesn't touch him. And by the time you, you know, and then he, of course he reaches for things in the store and she says, no, you can't have that and I told you and you're trying to drive me crazy, which by the time he's 15 months old, she could be right. Um, but the point is that by the time they get to the checkout, they are both dysregulated, right? And she can't think about him and he can't think about her. And the first mother would have a reflective stance, you know, that is, she's aware that something is triggering his, misbeha his misbehavior, and she wants to do what she can to contain it, as opposed to a mother who might really feel that she needs to control him physically. And it's the hardest thing to do clinically, often, is to move a parent off the dime of, I want to control him, to you know, okay, let me calm down a little bit. Let me think about this. Let me wonder what's going on with him. Let me see if we can figure it out. And that is a really key shift that we work on all the time in minding the baby. But um, Linda Mays has done a lot of really fascinating work on kind of the balance between uh, arousal and regulation, and that once you get over aroused, you can't really mentalize anymore. So what we're trying to do always is to regulate arousal to the point where mothers can, and it's very difficult to do. I mean, this work is very hard. Um, trauma and intense negative affect severely challenge and may preclude neg uh, mentalization. That is, the more distressed the mother becomes, the more difficult this is. And one of the things that um, I think a lot about is how triggering an infant's normal behavior can be for a traumatized mother seeking care, wanting to climb up on her lap, uh, crying, reaching for her, all things that may have been very different in the mother's own experience that may be very triggering for her, or simply the feeling of being physically violated by the baby, which is a normal part of motherhood, right, of being 
physically, you know, taken over by the baby. And so that the feeling, the, the potential for threat in the mother-child relationship is high when you've had high levels of trauma. And the parents can be more vulnerable to implicit or imagined threat, and their own fear system gets read, readily activated. And this is, again, what I'm talking about when the arousal and the fight, flight, or freezing really gets triggered. And as I mentioned earlier, one of, the function, one of the things that happens when a mother gets triggered is she has difficulty seeing the baby as separate from herself, reading his cues, or observing his fear. And one of the things that Peter Fonagy says um, in his work on mentalization is that once you see the other person's fear um, and experience it and feel it, it's no longer possible to be violent toward that person. That is, that an appreciation of who's in there keeps you from being violent. But of course, if the child is triggering and threatening and no longer this tiny baby having a bad night, but something worse, then you, you really get um, the potential for violent behavior. And uh, this leaves the child um, alone and afraid. And um, one of my favorite people to write a lot about attachment trauma is John Allen, and I totally recommend his books, A-L-L-E-N. Now again, I talked earlier about a mother feeling like herself as a mother, and um, when you're overwhelmed by threat, you don't see yourself as a protector, and you don't see yourself as someone who's stronger and wiser. And Bowlby really talked about an attachment figure for the child needing to see themselves as stronger and wiser. And when you are overwhelmed, it's very difficult um, to feel that way. Now, um, I said earlier that disrupted parent, uh, parent capacity to keep the child in mind or hold the child in mind is related to attachment. Now, attachments, um, we are all born with the capacity to become attached. We're all born ready for relationships. And in particular, when we're threatened, we seek the care of our stronger and wiser caregiver. And what happens at that moment, moment is that the caregiver, where it's the mother, the father, the grandmother, their caregiving system is active, and they reciprocate by protecting the child. And the, if your experience as a child is that when you're threatened and you seek care, you receive it, that is going to be, be stored and contained in you in one way. If when you're threatened and you seek care, something else happens, either the mother turns away or she gets more frightened herself or she frightens you, then you're gonna have a very different experience of what happens when you seek care. And what happens is that infants adapt to their experience of seeking care. They learn when I you know, get upset, my mother shuts down and is not there and so I better modulate my distress if I want to maintain my relationship with her. And so the child, when the caregiver's response is not optimal, is that they learn how to contain their feelings so that they can get what safety and security they can. And they defend against those feelings that get in the way. So secure attachment, which um, is kind of the gold standard, um, what we you know, 65%, 70% of people in the population are securely attached, which is that, you know, when you're mildly stressed, uh, I mean, threat is a normal thing in everyday life, and hopefully it's resolved quickly, it's resolved within the relationship, the mother provides safety and a secure base, the child feels free to explore the world and regulate negative affect, and it's, we think of it as a protective factor. And mothers who, um, turn away, I found these little slides on the internet, who turn away when uh, the, the child might be needy, they learn pretty quickly to keep their feelings to themselves. And I love this slide, which I also found on the internet, which is a child in a tiny little wading pool wearing a big inner tube with more inner tubes in about three inches of water, which is that mother is so anxious about separation that the, the child learns, well, I guess if I, if I separate, it's gonna freak her out and I better stay close. And you know, she really, um, whenever I feel frightened, she amplifies it. And then what we see in the more pernicious situations that are what we're really trying to avoid is that mothers who, when the child um, is threatened or needs them, becomes frightening, as in, 
looming and scary, which unfortunately we see a fair amount about, or becomes frightened and withdrawn, right? We think of that as potentially being dissociated. So that leaves a child in a very difficult biological situation. I am threatened, I'm over aroused, and I can't get what I need from my mother because, or father because she is at, at the moment scaring me. And so the child doesn't develop a uh, systematic way of seeking sa safety and re remains disoriented and confused. And this is highly represented in clinical samples. And as I said, there are some links that have been found with um, borderline personality disorder in, when there are maternal histories of unresolved trauma or loss. Um, and we found that the more able a mother is to mentalize, the more likely she is to be secure in relation to attachment, the more likely the child is to be secure, and the lower level, uh, the less it's likely that the child is to be disorganized. So um, what we're trying to do then is to decrease relational trauma and maltreatment, to address the mother's own trauma history, to help mother identify herself as a caregiver, to enhance mother's capacity to think about the baby. To, and I, think about the baby is not the right word. Um, it's to um, uh, Mary Tarje, who's uh, a, a done a tremendous amount of work in this field, said it's thinking about feeling, thinking about the baby's feelings, but also feeling about thinking, meaning that affect is not left out of this picture, that, but it's integrated and coherent in, within the context of a thought. That is, affect doesn't become dysregulated and disorganized. Um, increase rates of secure attachment, decrease rates of disorganized attachment, and increase harmonious interactions with, by decreasing maternal frightened and frightening behavior. Um, okay, so now I'm going to talk about minding the baby, which is a mentalization-based intervention, and Carla Sharp is going to be talking later about other mentalization-based interventions, and we uh, got some of our inspiration from the work that um, you all have been doing at Menninger's for a long time. Um, and as I said, these are, this is our team, which is, uh, and these are some of our supporters. And uh, these are many of our helpers. <laughs> okay, so what is Minding the Baby? Uh, it's a service uh, that we, it's an interdisciplinary uh, program. It's a team that is, services are provided by a team that is made up of a master's prepared uh, licensed social worker and an advanced practice nurse so that they have a high level of training. And each one has their own work and they have overlapping work so that the healthcare provider works on health related issues, the social worker works on mental health and infant parent psychotherapy issues and together they work in a variety of ways and, and also on, on a variety of um, social service needs. I mean, the, the level of support that our moms need is really great. And together they work on attachment and parenting. They alternate visits, that is, they go, one goes one week, one goes the next week. Um, it's a blend of a nurse, fam, a nurse home visiting and infant parent psychotherapy model. They are supervised together um, and separately. But the idea that we had in developing this program was that you focus on a range of needs and try to address a range of needs. It's a relationship-based model. Um, the first, second, and third thing that the home visitors try to accomplish is to develop a safe relationship with the mother. Um, safety has been implicated. As, as safety is so important in so many treatments, and it's certainly, if you read Christine Courtois' work on working with complex trauma, the achievement of a safe relationship with a practitioner is so important. And the mothers talk about how important this is too, with a pr predictable, concerned and caring, helpful, supportive, non-threatening, right? We're trying to avoid the spike in arousal. Um, the connection between the mother and of course between, and, and the clinicians, and the child and the clinicians. That is the mother, uh, the child has a relationship with the clinicians after they come into the house for 27 months. Um, so there are multiple relationships, which if we thought would be very complex for traumatized moms, but actually they do very well with this. Um, we have high levels of trauma in the population that we serve. We do have a, some, a fair number of complex trauma disorders. Uh, we see in them con chronic over and under arousal, that is they're either very shut down or very dysregulated. 
profound disruptions in the stress regulation system. And oftentimes, and this will be true in the case that I'm going to talk about shortly, um, you don't necessarily hear about the trauma in the first visit or the second visit or the third visit or the tenth visit or the 26th visit, but it may come out very late in the treatment and you're really working, knowing it's there, kind of working from the various signs, maybe some of those post-traumatic adaptations that tell you it's been there. Um, you're attending to nuances in the mother's reaction, titrating discussions, attuning to dissociation, just being very aware of that. But uh, one of our major emphases is to develop or enhance a parent's capacity for mentalization, to be able to reason about or reflect upon the child's thoughts, feelings, wishes, needs, etc. And the mother's capacity to do that, we believe, is very regulating for her as well as for the baby. And as I said, it's based on a lot of other work done in mentalization theory. Uh, the framework of the model is we start in the transition to parenthood. The transition to parenthood is an incredibly rich developmental moment. Many, I, um, when I was a kid, I, uh, Selma Freiberg wrote the most beautiful, wonderful paper on infant parent psychotherapy, working with very traumatized mothers in 19, the first paper came out in 76. And I started, uh, was trying to start an infant uh, parent program, probably it was about 1984, 82. And I went to meet with one of the um, people who had written uh, the book with Freiburg on early infant mental health. And I forget what naive supposition I had laid on the table as a young person, um, you know, and she said, you need to remember that every mother, no matter what their childhood experience, wants to do better for their child. There is not a single parent under any circumstances. And that is what Selma Freiberg called having God on your side. It's just that knowledge that when you're working with a mother, whatever else gets in the way, she does have this desire, particularly when she's pregnant, right? In this rich developmental moment where things are changing hormonally, her body is changing daily, and there are crucial biochemical changes going on, and these will be, and these these hormonal biological changes will be going on not only prior to birth but immediately after birth. The opportunity for attachment is very high at this point, and as is the opportunity for trouble, right? Because it's such a vulnerable developmental period. So this is a period that we start in the second trimester of pregnancy. Um, it says third here, but actually we try to get in in the second. You missed that one, Rosie. <laughs> Rosie is really good at double checking my slides. Um, and we go weekly until the child is one, and sometimes much more often. And then every other week till the child is two. We are very flexible. As I said, we go more often as needed or whatever. And we use a wide variety of curricula and approaches. So I'm going to uh, briefly run through this to get to our findings. That is, we began 13 years ago, and we've been randomizing subjects into control and intervention uh, uh, groups uh, from conditions from the beginning. We've had 237 families enrolled in the study. Uh, 133 of these have gone through the intervention. And I'm going to talk about our data from 105 intervention and control families. And it's a high-risk inner-city sample with high levels of poverty, family disruption, trauma, substance use, uh, in the, uh, substance use in the immediate family. None of our moms are using actively themselves, not heavy drugs, there's recreational drug use, of course. It's a first childbirth, um, mothers between 14 and 25 who are not involved in major drug use or have a major terminal illness. And we collected data at, in, okay, um, somebody's, Okay, uh, we collected data in pregnancy, four months, 12 months, and at graduation at 24 months. We collected a variety of health records, uh, behavioral inter interaction, attachment, mentalization data, et cetera. And we had 60 mothers in the intervention group. Their average age is 19 and a half. 
Most had completed through the 11th grade. 66% were Latina, the remainder primarily black and other mixed background. Um, a small number were married, a larger number were cohabiting. Some mothers had no contact with the baby at all. And interestingly, in our Mining the Baby group, uh, they had a high level of social service involvement, meaning that their parents were being watched by child protection because they had been abused. So the mothers themselves had um, open uh, DCF cases. And one of the, uh, just to go through our findings, the Mining the Baby group was more likely to be up to date on their immunizations at 12 months, which is an important public health outcome. We had no open cases in the Mining the Baby group with respect to protective services. That is, none of the kids um, in the intervention group had been reported for child maltreatment. And we, um, uh, we, and the control group had 5% open cases, which did not reach statistical significance, but it almost did. So we are, we are seeing uh, a very, uh, uh, an impact on health outcomes and on child protection. And we are also seeing that mothers in our intervention group are much less likely to have subsequent children right away. You know, one of the biggest public health, important public health outcomes is to space children at two years or more. And often in this community, you know, children, moms will have babies right one after the other. And we've been pretty successful in, in uh, working really strongly around birth control um, to get um, moms to wait until they have a second child. And that in and of itself, as um, the home visitors could tell you, can be very challenging. Uh, when we looked at the mother-baby interaction at four months uh, using uh, Carlin Lyons Ruth's ambiance measure, we found uh, there was much less disrupted uh, communication among the mothers and babies at four months, particularly with teens. And what this means, and I will talk about it a little more when I get to the case study, but at four months, they've only been in the intervention for, for seven months, right, since the uh, third trimester of pregnancy. And so we were hoping that we would see changes in the interaction as early as the babies being four months old. And in fact, we did. Mothers were less likely to either be looming and frightening with the baby or withdrawn and um, in, in, uh, disengaged. Most significantly for us, we found that at 12 months, there was a significantly higher percentage of securely attached infants in the intervention group. And we have added many subjects to this group since uh, running these initial analyses, and we have consistently found a higher level of secure attachment in uh, the children um, in the intervention group, and more importantly, a significantly lower percentage of disorganized infants in the intervention group, and that has continued to hold. So we feel that we're really um, getting somewhere in terms of um, attachment outcomes. And we found that everyone's uh, RF got better over time, including those in the control group, uh, in part because um, the, uh, you know your baby better as you, as you uh, get to know the baby. But in higher risk mothers, that is mothers who started with very low levels of mentalization in pregnancy or those who had had less schooling, their RF, their mentalization, I'm sorry, I didn't define RF and mentalization tends to be used um, interchangeably, and they don't actually mean exactly the same thing, but we don't have the time for me to make the fine distinction between those two. But when you, what you measure in mothers is their reflective functioning, that is their capacity to reflect on the baby. And the higher risk mothers in our group were much better at that than were the mothers in the control group. And then we did a follow-up of a smaller number of children and we found that, remember I was talking about early adverse childhood experiences and behavioral outcomes, we found lower levels of externalizing acting out behavior in the minding the baby sample versus the control group. So we're, we're hope, we hope you know, that we'll continue to see this, but there are lower levels of problematic externalizing behavior disorders um, at follow-up. And the mothers in minding the baby reported less parenting stress than did those mothers in the control group. So we were very happy um, with these findings, and we felt that we were having, um, we hope we're having an impact 
on the, um, the what do we uh, what do I want to call it, the interruption of the intergenerational cycle of the transmission of abuse so that the adverse experiences that the mother might have experienced are not being repeated in the child's experience. And of course, when they are, we're right there to intervene. So we've had a three-site replication in the United Kingdom begun in 2011 in, in collaboration with the National Center for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children and the Anna Freud uh, Center. And um, I think we're, our goal is to help mothers be open and curious about their own and the child's emotional experience, to be aware of their own and their infant's physical states and to provide care for the child, and to remain non-defensive and unthreatened and able to regulate and contain their own and their child's distress. And to, one of the things that is so frequently emphasized in parenting interventions is teaching parents parenting skills. And parenting skills, um, I believe, it, I believe it is futile to teach parents skills without teaching them understanding. That is, until they can take a reflective stance. You know, I wonder why, even though I've told him that, you know, he can't go to that, that he, that he can't go to that electric socket, you know, I understand that he doesn't make any sense of no and yes vis-a-vis -vis this and why this incredibly interesting thing isn't something he can go and play with. So I need to take his development into account that as a parenting skill involves developmental understanding, which you can't acquire unless you're curious about the child. But we hope that the kind of work we do provides a basis for developmental and anticipatory guidance for self-efficacy and improved life course in the mothers, and indeed we see that. Um, we spend a lot of time establishing a relationship with the moms. We try to help the clinicians remain reflective. But it's very important to understand that when you work um, with highly traumatized individuals, you can easily become over-aroused and threatened yourself and have a variety of very intense emotional reactions to the work. And we provide layers and layers of supervision to managing this. And we try to help the mothers wonder what is going on and why, whether it's in themselves or in the baby, without threatening her and triggering fight, flight, or freezing. And we hope to see the gradual emergence of mentalizing capacities and sensitive mothering. And I just, this is my favorite slide right now. Um, and the, the point that I try to make with this slide is we try, is we try to help mothers get to a space where they can be open and honest and they can reflect on their experience, reflect on their history, reflect on what's going on with the baby, reflect on what's going on with their partner without dipping into either a hyper-aroused, dysregulated state or shutting down and going into an un under-aroused, over-regulated state. And the interesting thing about this diagram is the clinicians, 10 minutes, whoa, okay. The clinicians are as vulnerable to these curves. Hopefully it's not as vulnerable, but they can be vulnerable too. And sometimes you'll see the clinicians getting hyper aroused and the moms getting under aroused. You know, it's like they shut down because the clinicians gotten really worried because there's violence going on. And this is something that's very important to monitor. Okay, these are some comments by Mining the Baby Mothers, which um, the one I love best is they give you pieces of your heart. And these are cupcakes that a formerly homeless woman who started a cupcake business did for us, which says care, love, minding the baby. They're always there to help. And there's my promised email address so you can write me for the complete slides. Thank you very much. So much, Dr. Slade. Um, we have many questions coming in, so we'll get through as many as we can. Unfortunately, Dr. Slade is not able to be with us for the panel at the end. So again, we'll do our best with this. Um, and uh, there might be some questions here that uh, perhaps Dr. Sharp might know, might be able to answer with regard to uh, research on mentalization-based uh, treatments, which she'll also okay. be discussing. She will, um, she will know that literature inside and out. And I will be around until um, 2.15, so. So people might be able to approach people you on can, a break. Why, okay, right. so questions. The first one is, can you please speak to how mentalization differs from empathy? Hmm. Oh, well, that question has probably been asked 4,000 times, or maybe 40,000. 
Um, because it's a, it's a, empath I'm gonna give you the simple answer. Carla may wanna jump in and, and add her piece. But empathy does not involve, at a very basic level, as much distance, right? That is, as much perspective, because empathy is, a, is an emotional reaction. And you can have empathy for your child, and you can still give them that soda in line at the store, right? But it's that capacity to have a, some perspective, to have your cognition working, if you will, at the same time that your emotional reaction is working. So that um, many people equate empathy with mentalization, but in fact, they're not the same because mentalization is defined, and I, I'm sure Dr. Sharp will speak about this more, as a, as a function of the frontal cortex, right? And that's why um, when arousal goes wild, you know, the frontal cortex is not functioning the way that it should. So empathy, I would think of as in part a lower brain response, but the mentalization, you know, adds a piece to that. So. Thank you. Um, we have a question about how active the uh, treaters are focusing on either the trauma history of the mother or directly on the mentalization. Mentalization is something that uh, the uh, home visitors receive extensive training in. Uh, it's a big part of supervision. So mentalization is something that they're trying to do all the time from the beginning to make the mother more aware of herself in pregnancy, to begin to make her more aware of the baby, so that it's an active part of the relationship. And oftentimes, it's the clinician who mentalizes first, and then we're hoping that the mother can begin to calm down enough to begin to use some of these same capacities herself. Um, the treaters are only as active as they can be with the trauma history. You know, this is actually, I think, an ongoing debate within the context of infant parent work. This is a voluntary program. This is something offered to moms um, if they desire it as part of their prenatal care. And oftentimes, as was the case with Natasha, it took a very long time to figure out who the father of the baby was, what had really happened between them, what had really happened with her mother. It took. 18 months before she agreed that her own mother was toxic, even though having told stories of you know, maltreatment earlier on in, in her work with the home visitors. So you know, you can, you, you know, it's not a trauma-focused CBT, let me put it that way, that we work with the trauma as, I mean, would you two agree with that? That you, it comes up as you, as you can, and, but you're very attuned to it, you know, and you try to bring it up, but you can't. Thank you. Um, there's a question about, can you, can you speak to the difference between um, a uh, primary maternal preoccupation versus borderline personality disorder or, or features in talking about the, the moms? It's kind of, are we talking about, to what extent are we talking about borderline personality disorder or features in the moms versus the, the trauma, the various ways you've talked about the, the, the problems that the mothers have? I'm afraid I don't understand. I guess the, the, I guess the question is 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 so uh, coming back to to the the conference focus on borderline. Yes. Are we talking about the at-risk moms? Are we talking about moms who struggle with borderline features? Some, some yes. I mean, this woman um, that I talked about um, was had you know very strong narcissistic features. It was really reflected in her relationship with everyone, but particularly the home visitors. It caused tremendous counter-transference issues for the home visitors. Um, we thought that she had some um, impulse issues and affect regulation problems that would um, call her having borderline features. Um, and certainly, a number of the moms have complex trauma disorders, potentially borderline problems. Um, I would say, you know, we don't, we don't do a skid at the beginning of the study, you know, so we, we just go on our clinical instincts, but I think the thing I would say in terms of primary maternal, you asked a question about primary maternal preoccupation. So That's what threw me about off. About uh, preoccupation, about uh, uh, primarily on maternal preoccupation. I think the mother focused on self versus borderline personality disorder or something like that. I think that's the, I think that's the question. 
Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Emily just right. gave you, you something that. Okay, we have a question about how can extended family members um, be effective in intervening if, uh, if there's a number of warning signs in the behavior of the parents. So I think this is looking at grandparents and other things like that. If they have concerns about the sort of things you're talking about, what might they do? Mm. Um, I guess the simplest answer that comes first to my mind is um, a child needs a secure base. And if it's the grandmother, if it's the uh, father, if it's an aunt, if it's someone who, you know, really can provide that for the baby when, I mean, obviously, this, the answer is to get help if it's, if it's possible. Um, oftentimes, as a grandparent or an aunt or an uncle or an extended family member, you're somewhat paralyzed in your ability to help up to a certain point. But I do, I do think of adult patients I've worked, about, worked with who have talked about the important, and Alicia Lieberman and Bill Harris have written about this, they talk about it as angels in the nursery, as people who are critical, incredibly important, organizing, regulating figures for the child. Um, and so that, that's one function, for example, of grandparents. It's one function of extended family members. Um, you know, I think of a, uh, someone I know who, um, you know, is terribly concerned about her daughter's interaction with her child, and she just resolved to be there for the child as much as she possibly could, and that, you know, somebody who loves you who's regulating for you is very important. Uh, someone along these lines, we have a number of people asking about the inclusion of the fathers in minding the baby. If father, speak I, to that. That um, should, shame on me for not having that more prominently in the slides. If the fathers are around, they are involved. If they're home, they're included in the home visits. We make special efforts to do the home visits at times that they can attend if they want to be. Grandmothers are often, big part, siblings. We've had a number of siblings in minding the baby, but siblings who may be younger than the mom will sit there and, and receive part of the intervention and hopefully take it in you know, when they have babies themselves. Uh, there's a question here, oh, about um, to what extent does mind, minding the baby take into account cultural differences in parenting, familial relationships, et cetera? Um, is it sufficient to say very much? Can you say, speak a little bit to, to, yeah, to the I role mean, of culture as it we're, comes into we're play? Working, um, we're working in a very uh, diverse, uh, with mothers from diverse cultures um, in the areas in which we work. There are families from the African American community, there are families from Puerto Rico, from Dominican Republic, from South America, from uh, the West Indies, et cetera, and there are um, individuals who've you know, lived in, in uh, New Haven th their whole lives, and there are people who are just more fairly recent immigrants. And one of the things that our home visitors work incredibly hard on is starting from the position of, I need to learn from you about what you feel, given your cultural you know, perspective, et cetera, works for you and your baby. But also, obviously, we're often countering cultural ideas like it's um, well, let me try to think, you know, um, for instance, about what foods are good for babies or when food, certain foods should be given to babies or whether you should ever let a baby cry. You know, all of those kinds of things are intensely culturally mediated, and there rarely is a right answer. That's, you know, got to be adjusted to the family and so on. Uh, given the uh, things you spoke about in terms of... Um, uh, child Protective Services involvement, that sort of thing. Can you speak to how to maintain or regain safety in connection to the therapy relationship if the providers have had to um, make mandated reporting calls themselves? Um, well, uh, we have um, had, um, well, one mother that I can speak to. Um, w when you have to make a report, the place you start is with the mother and really helping her understand why you're having to make this report, you know, what it's going to mean. Um, I, I'm trying to think that um, in the case, um, we have, in the case I'm thinking of, which is, is really uh, the only case it, that it's happened in, in uh, the last 13 years, uh, it was the hospital that made the report because they didn't feel that the mother could take the baby home. And we became very involved both in working with the social, you know, with um, child protection, working with the hospital, 
super, helping the mother in the supervised visits that she had with the child, being present for all the supervised visits, really, and then helping her when the baby came back home, you know, because they were reunited. So we worked very hard. And, you know, it's going to disrupt the relationship if you're the one having to make the call, but hopefully you spend enough time working with the mother, understanding why it's necessary to make the call and what, how you're going to support her through the, you know, you don't just make the call and go away. Uh, there are a few questions. We'll end with uh, these ones before, um, before our break. And again, uh, a lot of the other questions were more about methods, which I think we can probably bring to, to uh, Dr. Sharp. Uh, there's a number <laughs> of questions um, about uh, to what extent this can be extended to other groups, um, to mothers who have uh, children of, uh, starting when the children are older mm -hmm. than infants, uh, higher socioeconomic status, and questions in general about how do you refer people, how do you get into these programs? Well, if you're interested in minding the baby, Krista is the person to contact, um, and uh, we can uh, navigate referrals through Krista. Um, these kinds of, of mental, mentalization-based programs are increasingly in place for children, for adolescents. I know Dr. Sharp is going to talk about some of the programs that they set up at Menninger's. I mean, our focus is really on infants, but um, mentalization-based programs have been developed by people at Menninger's for children, you know, um, through the middle childhood and on to adolescence. Um, is that? Sort of answer the question. That that, an, I, that, answered, um, that part was about the ages, uh, socioeconomic status. Did you mention that about? Uh, yeah. it's, it's primarily about lower socioeconomic status. Well, is there, is I mean, a, we've worked with underserved, um, very uh, uh, challenged families who are vulnerable because of their socioeconomic status. Um, I don't have any illusion that these are uh, unique to um, families you know, in low socioeconomic groups. Um, it's much, and this program I think would be wonderful for someone in any SES group. Um, that, as you probably know, that becomes a much more complex issue of referrals and acknowledgement and so on, but. Thank you so much, Dr. Slade. Thank that you. was, a, uh, we so appreciate your time and expertise. Thank you.